1 through 10. I'd like to read that for us. It's one of the accounts of the triumphal entry. You'll find other accounts in Matthew and Luke as well, but we'll be uh, looking at this one primarily. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and, so, and as soon as you have entered into it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. Remember that. The Lord has need of it. And immediately, he will send it here. So they went on their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing losing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those following cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Wow. Powerful time in the life of Jesus, and yet the great accomplishment was yet to come when he would make atonement. We have a young donkey here, a colt. <laughs> you might say in some ways, and you'll see, the young donkey could represent all lowly sinners. All lowly sinners. And yet the donkey was chosen to fulfill God's plan. You say, a donkey? I've heard of people chosen to fulfill God's plan. But yet a donkey? Yes, indeed. It was prophesied more than 400 years, actually about 500, before this event happened in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So you see, God had plans for this donkey. It was prophesied. And in so many ways, you might say, we could learn lessons from this donkey, who had never been written on. Not at all. Well, let's look at some lessons that we might learn. I mean, we certainly learn lessons from the disciples. Jesus sent them, they obeyed and went. Jesus said, when they ask you, you tell them this, and certainly they were asked, and they said what Jesus said. They were obedient. We learn obedience uh, from the disciples. But you say, well, what can we learn from the donkey? In what ways? Might we be like him? Well, I know some would say, well, I'm pretty stubborn like a donkey in some ways. Uh, I'm like him in that way, but uh, I haven't really thought of other ways. Well, let's look at that this morning. First of all, as we think of the cult of this donkey of Palm Sunday, number one, you are needed, and I. We are both needed. We are both needed. Does God really need anything? Well, technically speaking, of course not. But yet, as we read this account, we read when they answered those who said, why are you loosing the donkey? He said, the Lord has need of him. 
The Lord has need. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? The God of all creation, who sustains and upholds all things, has need. He needs a donkey. And might we say that the Lord has need of you too? And the Lord has need of all of us. All of us. As a matter of fact, it tells us quite clearly that God also, like he had a plan for that donkey, he has a plan for us. In Ephesians 2.10 we read, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now listen to this. Which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God had plans for us a long time ago that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And it's needful that we obey what his plan is for our life. It's needful that we follow that plan. As a matter of fact, he even chose us for this plan before the world was created, before the foundation of the world. Boy, does that make you feel special, right? In Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, who doesn't want to be blessed with every spiritual blessing? But it goes on to say in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, he had a great plan for us. Just like in Zechariah 9.9, 9, he had a plan for that donkey. He really did. He has a plan for us as well. And he wants us to fulfill that plan. And dear Christian, you and I can have that joy and that peace and be happy and be victorious and less. We're living out the plan that God has for our life. And the question is, are we fulfilling it? Are we living it out? Are we walking in all of those works and all of those things that God has planned a long time ago, way before we were born, for us? Are we living in holiness and love? Are we living without blame? That's what he's chosen us to do. You see, he needs us to be obedient and use us. He wants us to use what he's given us. You say, well, okay, what has God given me? Well, in 1 Peter, the apostle Peter speaks about that. He's given us things that we should use. You might say is stewardship. In 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, it says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God God's very grace. So you and I have gifts. The moment you were saved, God blessed you with a spiritual gift. Some have the gift of encouragement. Others have the gift of teaching. Some have the gift of administration. Some have the gift of helps. You know, whatever the gift is, you have it. And some have more than one. But we are called to be accountable to use that gift we have. But you know, the greatest gift we have is eternal life. And to share that with others is a most wonderful thing. And we are called to do that. We all can do that. We all can share the good news. We all can share that gift. What a stewardship we have of the greatest news of all time. Dear friends, it can cure all the ills of the world. You've got it and I've got it, but we have to share it. We're called to be obedient. We're called to be obedient. He needs us to do that. We're his arms, we're his legs, we're his voice. He needs us. Goes on to say in verse 11, uh, 1 Peter 4, whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles or words of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God that he supplies in order that God might be glorified in everything through Jesus Christ. Dear friends, we have gifts we have blessings. Are we using them? He needs us to do so. He needs us to do so. You know, Jesus needed disciples. And we read in Matthew 10 that he chose 12 disciples. Could he have done it without them? Surely he could have. But he chose them. 
And he needed them to go out, go out into the world, go out into Samaria, eventually go out into Jerusalem, and, and the eventual areas are in there, primarily to the Jew first, and then to the whole world. But he needed them. He chose them. He picked them. Now he chooses us for the very same thing. And he's chosen us before him. Dear friend, you're needed. I'm needed. Just like that little donkey was. Jesus needed him to do his mission. Jesus needed him to fulfill scripture. And you know what? We fulfill the plans that he has planned for us before the creation of the world. And it really is necessary that we live out that life that he's planned for us. It's a rich life. It's a good life. It's a full life. The Bible calls it the abundant life. But he needs for us to be obedient. He needs for us to surrender. Secondly, as we look at this donkey, we learn that you are to carry Jesus. You are to carry Jesus. We read in verse 7 of our text, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Dear friend, you and I are to carry Jesus. The colt carried Jesus to Jerusalem and to the multitude of people. We also carry Jesus to the multitudes that God has placed in our life. We carry Jesus to the workplace. We carry him to the schools. We carry him to the neighborhood. What did he say? Eventually, when he gave them that great commission, when he said, carry me to the whole world, go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, Jesus told them to carry the message everywhere. We carry Jesus just like that donkey did. Because as that donkey carried Jesus, they saw their hope. They saw the Messiah. They saw salvation. Some trusted. Most didn't at that time, it seems. Some trusted. But dear friends, you and I to carry Jesus. Some will trust. Some will not. But we're to carry him. Carry the message everywhere starting where we are, right in our Jerusalem. And yes, to the nations. Some can go to the nations, but we pray when we can. But we, we carry it worldwide. Mark says the same thing in Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all of creation. But we go into all of our world because we may not be able to go in the whole world, we do that by prayer and by giving, yes. But physically, we may be limited. But we're to go into our world where we are. Turn to Mark 5 for a moment. Mark 5, and we remember that wonderful story, right? Of the demoniac that was healed of so many demons, having legions of demons in him. Oh, what a story that is. Uh, one of my favorites. But I, I think as I look at that story... What blesses me is the fact that after he was healed, he wanted to go with Jesus, and that's normal. Uh, this poor man was tormented for who knows how long with so many demons cutting himself, screaming, walking in the cemetery, breaking chains, breaking shackles. Uh, I mean, what kind of a life? Talk about quality of life. It was terrible. He couldn't get free of these demons, and Jesus freed him. He was finally free. He was back in his own mind again. Oh, how wonderful that was. We read in verse 18, And when he got into the boat, he had been, uh, the man who had been demon-possessed begged Jesus that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him. But Jesus said, Go to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim to Capolis and all that, all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. Dear friends, that was his world. That was his part of creation. We can't do all things, but we can do some things where God has places and he was faithful and he carried Jesus. He carried Jesus with him. 
into those areas and he told those what great things the Lord has done for him. And they marveled. And dear friends, boy, I'll tell you, when we carry Jesus and tell him what the Lord has done for us, how we're saved, how the great future we have, and eternal life he's given us, they're going to be interested. They're going to want to know how. They really will. It's fantastic. So we're blessed to see that. It was said of the Apostle Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul was so rugged, he was so persecuted too, and those who went with him on their first missionary journey, they were persecuted and they went from place to place. They fled from town to town. And Acts 4, 14, 7, it says this about it, that they continued to preach the gospel, even though, even though they were persecuted, even though their life was hanging in the balances, they went from town to town to escape even death. Wherever they went, they continued to preach the gospel. They continued to carry Jesus. Wow, it's amazing. You know, I love that verse in 2 Corinthians 2.14 because you and I, when we carry Jesus, we leave a fragrance. We leave an aroma. Have you ever thought about that? We really do. Uh, about as a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 2.14, it puts it that way. It says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifest, shows through us the sweet aroma, the sweet fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. Isn't that an amazing thought? The sweet fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. And that's what happens when we carry Jesus. For those who believe is life to life. But for those who don't, they have the fragrance of death. Wow, what a powerful thing. So you and I then, you and I are called to carry Jesus. We're needed. He needs us. He chose us. He's planned it for us. Now we're to carry Jesus. Carry the good news. Number three, you and I are to be under his control. Verse 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus and he sat on it. You and I are to be under his control. Now this can be the hardest part for us. And you know how some donkeys can be. Outright nasty. The fact is you and I can be stubborn at times. And the only way we can carry the gospel. The only way we can truly be what we're called to be. As he needs us is to be under his control. Now we read the colt was unbroken. Luke 19.30 says that. We read in Mark here, no one had ever sat upon this donkey, this colt. It was unbroken. So he'd go, he said, go into the village in front of you and enter, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Until you bring it here, you ever see those programs where they have different horses that they capture, some are wild, and they break them. You know how it is the first time they get on it? Man, I wouldn't want to be one of those guys, but they're just, you feel like everything in their body was just rattled. But not with this colt. Think about it. This little animal had the creator of the universe riding on his back. This little animal had its creator riding on his back. Uh, it was an amazing thought. Self-control, yes. If we are to be under his control, we are to have self-control. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is, right? Self-control, but don't get it wrong. It's not self-control, it's really spirit control that allows you and me to have self-control. It's his spirit, his power, that allows us to have self-control. So, but how do we do that? How do we get that? Well, by surrendering to God, by giving up. I'm not going to do it my way, God. I'm going to do it your way. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Say, Lord, you use me. 
I'm surrendering to you. I give you all that I have. It belongs to you anyway, but he wants us to give it to him. I surrender to you. I want to be under your control. I've been under my control so long, and I've made a mess of it. But I want to be under your control. So we surrender to him. Paul speaks about this brokenness. Paul speaks about finally coming under God's control in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Boy, being under control. How well are you controlled and I control? Under Christ. Are we under his control? Only you can answer that, and only I can answer that, really. Because we know areas of our life where really we could be so much better. We know we're needed. We know he chose us. We know we're to carry him. That is the message of him all over. But you know, it's a hard thing to do, to carry the message of Christ if we're not under his control. Can you imagine if that donkey was not under Christ's control and he was just going wild and all over the place? It'd make things quite difficult. And dear friends, sometimes we're like a wild donkey. Uh, we're not controlled by him as we ought to be. So how can we carry the message if we're not under his control? That's what we need to be. Now, what does it mean to be under his control? Well, it really means, let's turn to uh, Matthew 16 for a second. Matthew 16. Remember, Jesus was talking about what would happen to himself. And Peter picked it up, how Jesus would undergo crucifixion and be killed by the hands of wicked men. And uh, it just seems that he didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. And Peter said, Lord, this will not happen to you. This will not happen to you. This won't take place. This won't occur. But what did he say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Your interest is in the things of man and not the things of God. Dear friends, it shouldn't work that way, but it does sometimes, starting at verse 21, as we look at that. Peter took Jesus aside, verse 22. Can you imagine that? And G Peter, even though Christ said he would be crucified, he would be raised, and he, Peter said, oh, no, no way. He said, far be this from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. He's telling God what should happen. He's telling God how it should take place. Dear friends, you and I are not under his control when we're not on the same page with him. When God tells us how it is, when God tells us what it's going to be like, we don't question that. We don't say, no, I don't like that. It should be this way instead, Lord. Dear friends, Peter was not under the control of Christ. Peter thinking those thoughts saying those words and acting that way at that moment could not bring the good news to others because he wasn't prepared to. Uh, we know what happened. He finally got straightened out, very much so. Because, you know, he was caring. He was mindful about the things of man, but not the things of God. And when we are too mindful about the things of man, see things too much from the human perspective, and not the things of God, you and I, well, we're not able to be under his control. We trust in our own understanding and not his. Turn to Luke chapter 6, and we see another example. And here we see how we should and how we can be under his control. Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49. Jesus is quite frank. 
He said it quite clearly. If we're going to be under his control, we got to make him Lord. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Complete contradiction, isn't it? Boy, does that apply to the church today. Does that apply to my life and your life today? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? I hear you calling me Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you what he's like. You notice that? Number one, comes to him. Comes to him. Number two, hears his word. And number three, actually does them. Acts upon them. Now, that's the person who is under his control. So we can come to church. We can listen to what God has to say. But go out and forget all about it and do it our way. Wow, that's scary. And I believe this happening in churches all over Sunday after Sunday. So he goes on to say, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the, uh, and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house, he could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. On the other hand, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the streams beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Dear friends, to be under his control, to carry the gospel, to fulfill the need that Jesus has called us for, we must not only come to Christ, hear his word, but be obedient and actually do them. And that's the greatest problem. We go into biblical counseling. I sit with Christians. And that is the great problem right there. A lot of them, boy, they, they know the word of God. They can turn to scripture after scripture. But when you ask that potent question, are you actually doing it? And if you are, can you be specific saying how you are doing it? That's when they go, well, uh, well, I, you know, it's kind of hard and, you know, I don't have time and I'm busy. And there you go. There you go. They make all kinds of excuses and that explains it. Dear friends, we can never be under his control unless we're coming to him, hearing his word daily and actually doing it. And I tell you, that little colt was under the control of Christ. He was under the control of the Creator. And that made all the difference. And finally, number four, you are to be forgotten as Christ is worshipped. You and I are to be forgotten as Christ is worshipped, as we see in our text. And boy, I'll tell you, it was an exciting moment. They spread their clothes, verse 8, on the road, cut down branches, trees, and spread them on the road. Those who went before and those who followed were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You can see it. It's an exciting moment. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now at that moment, boy, I'm sure no one was thinking of that cute little coat that uh, was being written. They had their eyes riveted on Christ. They were celebrating. It was a wonderful time. The king had come. Mashiach had come, the Messiah. The Hamashiach, the king Messiah. It was wonderful. The coat was forgotten in that excitement. It was Jesus that was lifted up. You know, no one likes to be forgotten, but it is the best way to be remembered. No one likes to be forgotten, but it's the best way to be remembered. Because if we forget ourselves and exalt him, people will remember that we exalted Christ in our lives. And they'll remember us for lifting up Christ, not ourselves. So the further the Lord went, the more likely it is that people forget about the cult. Nothing about the cult took away from Jesus. Nothing about that donkey took away from Jesus. Are there things in our life 
that take away from Jesus. Wow, that's a scary thought. Because if we look over our lives and we pray, Psalm 139, 23, and 24, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked, sinful way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. We might think of a few things, maybe more than a few things, that take away from Jesus. So if there are things in our life that take away from Jesus, you know, it's hard to carry that message. It's hard to fulfill the plan for which we were chosen. It's hard to be under his control if there are things in our life that take away from Jesus. Wow. John the Baptist, he stated the best of all, didn't he? John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Yes. Beautifully said. Powerfully said. He must increase. I must decrease. You know, so often it is easy to exalt ourselves. Where people don't see Jesus. They're looking at us. And they're putting their trust in us and their faith in us. And oh, what a mistake that is. Because you know what? You and I can fall. And we often do fall. Uh, it's amazing. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I think Paul stresses this thought. Get your eyes off people. Put your eyes on Jesus. Amen. That's what we need. 1 Corinthians 3. He says it. So powerfully, verses 1 through 7. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. Oh, what a thing to say, right? Here you're a Christian. Paul says you're very carnal. You know, you're babes in Christ, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. Wow. I mean, what a rebuke. Just imagine being saved a long time. Uh, in our case, they might be 10, 20, 30, or, or longer. And Jesus says, you know, we're carnal. We need still pablum. We need milk instead of meat. And you say, oh, man, you know, for you are still carnal, for, there, for there's envy there, strife, divisions among you. Are you not carnal? And behaving like mere men, in other words, unsaved people. For one says, now look what they were saying. One says, well, I'm of Paul. You know, I, I follow Paul, man. He's cool. I like his preaching. I tune him in uh, all the time. And others say, oh, well, Paul's okay, but man, I, I like Apollos. He's my man. He's my man. Apollos, I follow him. Yeah? And he says, you know, are you not carnal when you say that? Are you not talking like worldly people? And he says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? Now, Kind of interesting, Paul himself is writing this. So he's talking about himself. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now listen to what he said. He wanted Christ to be seen and not them. Verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who orders, but God who gives the increase. Get your mind off us. Put it on God. Put it on Christ. Wow. I love that. He says it so wonderfully. So when we bring others to Christ, dear friends, we want them to see Christ. We don't want them to see us. Remember, I'm not building my own kingdom. I'm building his kingdom. Kate B. Williams who wrote the great hymn, May the Mind of Christ, My Savior, in the sixth verse of that small hymn, wrote this, May his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win, and may they forget the channel seeing only him. And dear friends, that's exactly what we are called to do. May they see only him. The donkey's position of service made Christ more visible to the crowd. We want to make Christ in our service more visible to others. When we humble ourselves, 
Christ becomes more visible to others through our life. We can get in the way of Christ working in our lives. And that's always a problem when we do that. Indeed, we have to forget about ourselves, our plans, our desires, our goals, if they're not lined up with what Christ has for us. That's how they see Christ in us. You know, Paul had some in Philippi. And he was speaking about those. Uh, and he said, they are all seeking after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. What a thought. How can Christians who are seeking after their own interests and not those of Christ carry the gospel? How can Christ be seen in them if they're seeking only after their own interests? Dear friend, it's happening a lot today. We've got Christians who are self-centered, not Christ-centered. You've got Christians who are seeking after me and mine and not Christ. And even in the first century, even in the first century in the early church, we see it there. Our goal is to be forgotten and Christ is to be seen. Someone has put it this way about the donkey. He was tied. He was tied. Many are hooked. Victims of habit bound by lifestyle. He was untamed, never ridden, stubborn, rebellious in nature. Some Christians can be like that too. He was outside. Many are with, outside without Christ, God and hope. He was at the crossroads. That donkey soon would meet Christ, his creator. He was by the, by the door, and that door was Christ. He was untied. He was set free. And doesn't Christ loose us and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free? He was brought to Jesus and we were. He didn't resist. Verse 7. He was used for the glory of God. Hosanna in the highest. And he submitted to the will of God. Jesus wants to make a triumphal entry into your life and to my life. So, to live as a donkey then, right? We must recognize God is requesting your presence and my presence so that we might be used of him. His plan for you and me is to let him be Lord of our life, daily clothe ourselves in the fullness of Christ, allow the Spirit to lead you and follow obediently, and humble yourself that others may see Jesus more clearly and faithfully in us, for he is worthy. Well, he wants to make that triumphal entry afresh as believers into your home, into your workplace, into this church, into your phone conversations with your loved ones, any place in that restaurant, wherever it is, the question is, Will we let him? Okay, we conclude with those four statements. Number one, you are needed. You are needed. He wants to use you to fulfill that great plan he has for your life. You're to carry Jesus. We're to carry the message. Wherever we go, people ought to see it through us. You're to be under his control. There's no way to carry the message unless we're fully under his control. And you and I are to be forgotten so that Christ can clearly be seen. Is there anything that's impeding, that's stopping in our life, Christ being clearly seen? I pray not. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for his truth. And thank you for the lessons we can learn even from this little donkey. And Father, may we be faithful indeed to surrender to you, to be under your control, to forget ourselves and just exalt Christ and to carry the great message that you've planned for us to carry. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.